abnormal bring us into the biology that underlies the challenge of addiction. Yeah, and uh, so I was asked to actually address the, what is it that we know about addiction and um, how does the brain lose its ability to control and self-regulate uh, drug, drug taking, which is ultimately what is addiction and it's characterized by the escalation of drug taking and the inability to control the strong urges to take the drug even though you cognitively may not longer want to do it and even though it's going to result in very catastrophic consequences. So there is this interplay between the loss of control and the enhanced motivation towards a particular st uh, stimulus, the drug. Um, uh, addiction, I mean, we now, we now and I think that um, 25 years ago, um, Alan Leshner had come up with a paper on the New England Journal of Medicine that said addiction is a, is a disease of the brain and it matters. And I think that it's until now that we are faced with this tragic epidemic of the opioid crisis that we're starting to recognize that it does matter. And it's unfortunate that we need to have a tragedy like this one to actually bring it to the fore. In the process, and actually starting at the time that Alan was director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse, there was a lot of research to try to understand first what is it that drugs do that actually can make them potentially addictive. And then the second question is, why is it that if people take drugs, not everybody becomes addicted? And I think that those basic questions have been at the essence of a lot of the research that has been emerging. To the question number one, why is it that drugs are addictive? Uh, we now know that drugs are addicted because all of them, regardless of uh, the mechanism, the pharmacological molecular mechanisms by which they do so, have the capacity and the ability to activate dopamine reward systems. And um, by doing that, uh, they actually generate a series of um, downstream uh, motivational uh, changes um, and in circuits that actually regulate behavior that in those that are vulnerable could lead, will lead to addiction. So it's, drugs are basically hijacking the reward system that biology, um, that emerged through development in biology to ensure us that we do things that are uh, crucial for survival. Eating uh, is motivated by the fact that it, it is rewarding. Uh, sex is motivated by the fact it is rewarding and that allows us to procreate. Drugs tap into this system, and in the process, they actually do it in what we call supraphysiological way, triggering neuroadaptations. So we know that, and as, and as Chris was discussing about the issue of drugs, we've also come to recognize that there are some drugs that can be more addictive than others. And in that respect, for example, opioid drugs are among, among the most addictive. And we know that uh, their addictive effect relies on the fact that they interact with a mu opioid receptor. And the mu opioid receptor stimulates downstream all of these dopamine reward pathways. But at the same time, these mu opioid receptor systems, of course, are very important for uh, modulating sensations of pain. And they're also very important in regulating respiration. And that's why their, their use is associated with overdoses, because you stop breathing. So, and, and why we have such a tremendous challenge with these drugs. Now, so everybody, everyone has basically, I would assume, ex been exposed, any one of us, most of us, exposed to a drug of abuse, and so alcohol, for example. And that is increasing dopamine in our brain, and it is perceived as rewarding. So we know that, but that does not in any way explain why is it that some people can just say, I had enough, and others lose control. So with imaging, now it is possible to go inside the brain and actually ask that question. Uh, and it was believed that people were addicted because ultimately, in them, the drugs would produce a much greater increase in dopamine, and therefore, the drugs will be more pleasurable. But with imaging, it became rapidly evident that that is not the case. And in fact, what you see in, in, in that slide to your left is the images that actually are used to uh, measure the differences in the increases in dopamine produced by, by drugs. In the upper part on a con on control subjects average across different planes, or planes, horizontal planes, and the colors represent the amount of uh, relative changes in dopamine produced in this case by the stimulant drug uh, methylphenidate given intravenously. And, and you can see that in the top and in the, uh, in the bottom is individuals that are addicted to cocaine. And you see that actually the threshold levels of significance have to be very different in controlled subjects, 0 0.001, 
because if one puts that level in the cocaine abusers, one does not see anything. So contrary to all of the expectations, what we're finding is that addicted people are actually having a very attenuated response to the drug of abuse, which is antithetical to what we had thought and raises questions to the notion of then why are they taking this drug? And what's intriguing about all of this is that people that are addicted, um, these very attenuated dopaminergic increases nonetheless are producing an intense craving. And that has actually been important because it gives us an insight that was not at the beginning very evident, which is that the reason why drugs are addictive is not that they produce the pleasure itself, but in so doing they generate a memory that we call conditioning. And conditioning, by conditioning, you are actually learning the association of stimuli that predict a reward, and those stimuli then by themselves will increase dopamine. And this is exactly where the malignancy in addiction relies on. You transfer the ability of the stimulus that drug to increase dopamine to the stimulus that preceded. And it is these increases of dopamine produced by the conditioned stimuli that then drive your motivation and that generate that, uh, that intense desire of the person that's addicted to the drug when they are in an environment where they've taken the drug, when they actually are stressed, when they get a very small amount of the drug, and that triggers almost an automatic response. So it's a memory. It's a memory that has been strengthened by the repeated stimulation of those dopaminergic pathways. And it turns, and I was listening to, to Corey this morning, and she said something that, that actually is very apropos of here. I mean, these, these neurotransmitters, these low neurotransmitters are stabilizing systems. And so what you are doing is by generating these dopaminergic uh, signaling prior to the drug consumption, you are stabilizing that behavior to motivate and drive the search of the drug. And that, that becomes very, very automatic. And, and at the same time, um, in parallel, because I wish addiction were as simple as that, that we have uh, basically a degradation of the response to the rewarding stimuli itself and hypersensitization to the conditioned one. If it were just those two systems that were affected on addiction, it would be relatively easy to actually buffer them. But in parallel, there are changes in um, systems that are regulated by dopamine, and in particular in the cortical areas of the brain. And that, again, has been one of the most surprising findings in addiction. That's why we put an enormous amount of emphasis initially on the limbic brain and the reward, uh, rewarding uh, areas of uh, the brain. What has emerged as one of the most important disrupted systems is that cortical areas that enable us to self-regulate and to exert self-control. So we've come to realize that, yes, addiction is a disease of the brain, and Alan, yes, it does matter, and we can no longer deny it. We also know that it's chronic disease, that it's relapsing, and that we know that there are genetic vulnerability factors that make you actually more likely to, to take drugs and more likely to become addicted to them. We also know that there are environmental stimuli that are very, very much uh, either providing you with resilience or making you vulnerable. And ultimately, it's in that understanding that we may be able to actually address, I think, what Uda was saying very clearly in our interventions, whether it is to prevention or treatment, is to build up the resilience of that brain so that it can buffer those disruptions produced by drugs or by your genetic vulnerability or by your adverse environments. Thank you, and I think Valerie will take us to this next level.